Hello and welcome to the Cardiac Cats YouTube channel. I'm your host, Jacob Shorba, and today we're going to be talking about the opening days of free agency and giving our grades on each of the moves. This will include players we sign from other teams, players we sign back to our team, as well as some of the departures, and then we'll talk about an overall grade. And I'll just go ahead and let you guys know that the overall grade is going to be weighed pretty heavily to certain things. So, you know, we may have like a lot of A's and not have, you know, even a B for the grade. So just understand that, that some things are more important than others. But overall, you know, you'll find throughout this video, a lot of the moves, like just talking about them by themselves, they make a lot of sense. But there's a few decisions that really change the outcome for how I feel about this free agency. And we'll talk about the end. And, and you guys also, of course, got some of my thoughts from our video yesterday talking about the Calvin Ridley news uh, heading to the Titans. So let's go ahead. Let's jump into this with our first move from free agency. I'll go ahead and count it. He was released. He was signed on the day of free agency tampering period opening. So Mitch Morse signed a deal for $10.5 billion over two years. So rough average of just over $5 million a year. How do I feel about this? Um... You know, if I just look at PFF and try to base everything off that, which isn't really fair, you got to watch film too, because sometimes it's not really reflective. Uh, for example, Anton Harrison. I don't even think he grayed out at a 60, but, you know, if you watch the film, you love what he's doing on the field. So with Mitch Morse, like, he grades out pretty well as a pass blocker, and, and he's kind of an average to just below average run blocker. But if you watch the film, this is a good football player, and he made the Pro Bowl recently. I believe it was in 2022, and it's not like he was cut because he played poorly. I mean, it seemed like his season was pretty much on par with what he does most years. He was cut because Buffalo had salary cap concerns, and so this was the perfect kind of signing to take care of that issue, especially since the guy I projected to them, Garrett Bradbury, never got released. So this made a lot of sense. It was a good fit. Doug Pearson's worked with him before. He was in Kansas City, I believe, when he was drafted. So there's a relationship there. And you're getting a guy who made the Pro Bowl very recently. You just got to you know, worry about age maybe a little bit because I believe he's in his 30s now. So at some point, like he is going to start falling off. I don't know if they'll be during this contract or not. Um, I'm sure a little bit will happen. We'll see what the extent is. But overall, like, it's a pretty good signing, especially when you look at his value from before, I think was like roughly double what he got paid. So pretty good deal for the Jaguars. And the important part of this, too, is that since Mitch Morse was released, this is considered a non-compensatory free agent. And that's incredibly important now because Calvin Ridley did not sign with the Jaguars and left the team. Because now you're trying to figure out how do I navigate to getting a compensatory pick? And this is one of the only things I would say is good news about that because, as we'll talk about in this video, the situation is currently pretty poor as far as their chances of getting a third round for Calvin Ridley. But Mitch Morse, just in a vacuum by itself, good signing, definitely like it. Um, only thing is I would have preferred, like, we went with a one-year signing and ideally tried to draft someone. I think we need to build young. I think we need to put a huge emphasis on building through the draft and focus on short-term solutions. So, you know, center is a position where I would have liked probably a one-year investment because now, even if you draft someone, you find a replacement, which will probably not happen, you have to release Mitch Morse. And then you have guaranteed money in the second year and you can't get a compensatory pick and all that stuff. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But um, still, two years is fine. I think he'll be a good starter during those. Now, Gabriel Davis, second move by the Jaguars. Another Buffalo Bill. Um, I'll say this. Something I kind of learned uh, projecting this stuff is sometimes there are really obvious moves that you just got to accept are probably going to happen. And I'll tell you, like, before free agency, I didn't really want Gabe Davis. And so the guy I thought Jacksonville was going to get was Kendrick Bourne originally, and that might have been the case at, at some point. But he ended up going back to New England, 
worked out a contract, so he never hit the market. And I think Jacksonville definitely would have been interested. Um, seems like those rumors were actually potentially confirmed by one of the inside sources, but I don't know 100% for sure. A little bit of speculation. But Gabe Davis, like, apparently they knew for days before free agency they were going to sign him. And so how do I feel about this? I'll say this, and this is why this grade, despite how much I didn't like it at the time of the signing, is not like a C or a D. It's because for the Jaguars, what I will say for them is that they've proven to me that with the receiver signings, I got to give them a chance. Like, I can't destroy them over something immediately because Christian Kirk was probably one of the most laughed at signings of the recent years. And we all thought, like, oh, gosh, we're going to pay this guy all this money. This is all guaranteed for, you know, half the contract at least, and we're going to be stuck with him. And Christian Kirk came out. In both seasons, he was on pace for 1,000 yards. You know, obviously he didn't get it in 2023. That's because of injury. He was on pace to pass his number from the year before. So Christian Kirk's been a really good player for the Jaguars. He's a, he's a borderline uh, high-end wide receiver two, low-end wide receiver one. I don't think he's, you know, Lee of the elite, but one of the best slot receivers in the NFL and a hell of a signing for the Jaguars. So when I consider that and how well Zay Jones went early before your injury concerns and all that stuff, like I can give Gabe Davis a chance because you see the potentials there. Like there's no doubt in that he's not even 25 yet as well. So there's a lot that they have to work with. They've got Chad Hall there. I think there's some concerns I had with the Buffalo Bills offense as well, which change when it comes to Jacksonville, because I think Buffalo's offense is very much focused on getting the ball to one player at a time. Like it doesn't seem like it ever gets spread out that well. And I know this just, you know, you can go back, look at Gabe Davis stats, like his games where they get him involved, he gets a hundred yards. And then there's the game the next week where he gets zero. Some of that's probably on him not being consistent or struggling against certain types of players. But I, I've also noticed this with like Stefan Dix, where he can go half a game without getting a target. I don't know what it is with their offense, but they just don't spread the ball around during games. It's usually like a select few people that get it and you just roll a die and it, you might be the odd man out. That, that's just how it seems to operate there. But as far as the potential of this signing and the kind of player that Gabe Davis is and the logic that the Jaguars had going into that move, it makes a lot of sense. Like it's not a terrible signing. Plus he's, uh, I think he's from Ferdinando Beach, or he's somewhere really close to Jacksonville, just northeast. Um, I mean, basically, he lived in Jacksonville. So that part of it's cool. Um, the other part of why this grade isn't, you know, just an A for all those reasons, I did not want the Jaguars to go out and spend at every single wide receiver position on a veteran. I think it's stupid, personally. And they were clearly intent on doing that and they still are right now because even though they lost down Calvin Ridley Zay Jones is still under contract right now we'll see how that ends maybe he gets released before the draft I don't know I imagine he sticks around as an insurance policy right now and then maybe gets cut after that we'll see what happens but you know I, I just don't want to spend that kind of money on the receiving core I mean you think about what they would have paid Calvin Ridley if they got him, which, you know, obviously there's a ton of flaws in their methodology to, to how they were planning to do that because they got completely outplayed. But say they paid him, like the $18, $19 million mark we're talking about. Say it's 18 you know, Christian Kirk's making 18 Gabriel Davis is making 13 Your wide receiver core costs you about $50 million a year. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, especially to not have – that bona fide number one receiver on the team. So I don't really want to be in that situation. I don't want to be overpaying at a position where every starter is locked up for years. And we're talking about, you know, we kind of wish it was a little better. We kind of wish we had this elite player on the team. So that's my concern with it. Now, obviously the end result kind of got out of that because Calvin walked and, you know, 
everyone has their opinions on that. You guys know mine. I, I, I've it's been different since the franchise tag deadline because originally, like I mentioned, and I even have it in writing because I try to take notes on what I would have done this off season because I want to compare it to what the team does and kind of learn a little bit from it. But my original idea was, you know, extend Josh Allen. It's the 30 million mark. That's actually the number he wanted before the Brian Burns trades. So that would have got done. And then it's tag Calvin Ridley, explore the trade market. And I think he could have gotten the trade with someone. I, like, I absolutely believe that now because he got paid more than what the franchise tag is per year. Someone would have sent you something for it. Now you don't know if you're going to get the comp pick. So that was kind of my place originally. But once he didn't get franchise tagged and they started spending money, I, I kind of wanted them to just get him back because I don't want to be in that situation where you just completely lose out on it. But, you know, obviously, worst case scenario right now, so far, maybe they'll get the comp pick. But just to clear that up, just my thoughts on that whole thing. But Gabe Davis, sorry, Gabe Davis, solid signing. You know, it, it's going to get laughed at a little bit, I think, by media and people who have had him in fantasy. <laughs> and, and that's fine, but I, I think he'll be fine here. Now, Darnell Savage, there's a little bit of discourse on what his role is, which I find interesting. The way I look at it is that I take comments from what I I read on the Packers talking about him, Joe Barry specifically, the DC for them, and I take what uh, Doug Pierce and Trent Baalke have said about Antonio Johnson. Because the question right now is, like, who's the safety, who's the slot cornerback? We don't know, technically. But the two things I go back to, one is when Antonio Johnson was first drafted and the media asked about him, and they asked them, like, what position do you see Antonio Johnson playing in the NFL? And they said safety. That was their immediate answer. Yeah, I understand he played a lot of snaps in the slot this last year. That's because the need was there. I don't think that's because they want him to be a slot cornerback necessarily. I think it's because... You know, you had Rayshon starting, you had Andre Sisco starting, even had Wingard back there. Antonio Johnson hadn't necessarily completely earned it, and you were worrying about who was starting in the slot. So you end up having Antonio Johnson go out because, well, he's going up against, what, Gregory Jr. to compete for that? And Jr. is in the same spot. I mean, he was an even later pick, and he had the really good preseason, but there's a shot for Antonio Johnson, right? And he performed really well. I think that's why he earned that role. So I look at that. Is that, that the team looks at him as a safety. And then I look at what Joe Barry said back in 2022, talking about Darnell Savage. He was basically saying that while the Packers have used him as a safety, they think that he would be an incredible slot cornerback. That's just their thoughts on it, right? Whether you agree with that or not, that's up to you. But those were their comments. And what they said was that they couldn't play him in the slot consistently Because they didn't have a safety. Funny enough, (laughs) right after that, the Packers trade back with the Lions, give them Brian Branch. I have no clue why, but that's the situation in Green Bay. And so they basically said, we want him in the slot ideally, but we can't play him there because we need a safety and that's more important to us. So one team's looking at him as a slot cornerback. The other one's looking at Antonio Johnson as a safety. And so I think when Savage comes in, and I look at the way he plays, his size, his speed, all the metrics, you know, just analyzing him at first, it just screams slot cornerback to me. It doesn't mean that he can't drop back and play safety and all that. He can. But I would so much rather see him in the slot. I think he could be a damn good player there. So I want to give that a shot if I'm Jacksonville. And I think they will. I think that's the plan. I think Antonio Johnson, as of now, is a starting strong safety. He's built pretty well for that, and I think that'll switch around a little bit, but that'll primarily be the lineup for these two players. So just want to get that thought out of the way. But as far as the signing and why I give it a C+, um, based off everything I saw, it sounds like they overpaid a little bit for him. I don't think it's a ridiculous number. You know, it's $21 million over three years. That's $7 million a year. It's okay. But there are concerns With Darnell Savage, he had a very inconsistent career in Green Bay. Some tackling woes there. I think 
he can put it together with Ryan Nielsen. I think he's going to be a phenomenal person for him to work with. But, I mean, could you have gotten him cheaper, perhaps? That's probably the, the main gripe with this move. And, and then I also, the other thing for me personally, is I like it when you can get a slot cornerback that can kick outside. I think that's best because then you have a player who is versatile and can kind of fill that need, fill multiple needs at once to where you don't need necessarily in as many backups. Players can shift around a bit. They're more um, versatile in the way they play. And that opens up roster slots to bring in more specialized players to add more of a dynamic to the team. That's generally a better thing. So that brings it down a little bit because I like my slot cornerbacks to be that way. But not a huge deal, right? Darnell Savage could be a very good player for the Jaguars. He has been inconsistent, though. It's a little bit more in the market value. I still like the fit, though. I still like the upside. I like the move. So it gets a C-plus for me for that reason. The Devin Duvernay, I originally gave it a D-plus. I move it up to a C-minus. And this has more to do with the compensatory pick issue. I'll just say that because we don't know right now if we're going to get one. And if we come up one player short of how many we need to lose and we don't get a third rounder, I don't care how good the kick returner is. Like, that is really bad business. And the way the Jaguars operate was basically as if they just assumed Calvin Ridley was coming back no matter what. Very poor way to operate. And so I think, like, Devin DuVernay, this would have been one I would have waited until I knew what was happening with Calvin Ridley and make the offer. I would have told him, look, like, we can offer you this much. You might beat out these other teams. you just got to wait a couple days. We cannot give you that right now. Just take your time with it. We'll get it sorted out. The fact that they made the move the first day is my primary concern with this because I don't know if that's going to work out that well for them, honestly. And I don't know as well if uh, Jamal Agnew, who's now going to part because of this, is going to get us a comp pick as well. You might have been better off just re-signing him, could have been cheaper, and you're not even worrying about it. So we're going to see what happens. I hope they get lucky. I don't know if they will. But that's a huge factor in this because you talk about the value of what he brings to the team. You know, it can flip games occasionally. It's very rare that that happens, of course, but he's one of the best. And so it has to bring it down still because to, to risk a third-round pick over that is insane to me. You know, to not at least take a couple days. But as far as Devin Duvernay, I mean, he's an all-pro returner. He's one of the best in the game. And the other thing with him as well is I think he can be a solid backup in the slot and outside for the Jaguars. He's never had like a huge season, but he's had around 400 yards each year. And then 2023 didn't really get used on the offense much at all. To me, that's not really an indication that he can't play offense. It's more so that the Ravens did load up at receiver. So that's obviously going to be a big factor in that. So just uh, some thoughts on Devin DuVernay there, but he's a good player. I don't think the money is crazy. I mean, it's cheaper than Jamal Agnew, and I think he's arguably more accomplished of a returner in terms of the awards. Obviously, the difference you know, being some of the, the great moments that Jamal Agnew's had in Jacksonville were going to be weighted towards that, but kind of my thoughts on it. You know, I don't hate the signing if I don't consider the outside factors, but I think it's really poor decision making to jump on that day one before you know the situation and and this could really bite them in the ass at the end of the day i cross my fingers it doesn't but if it does honestly they kind of deserve it because it's it's really stupid to have to have jumped on that so quick when you did not know what your situation was in free agency now got an a plus here ronald darby i'll be honest i i didn't know much about him before free agency that's why he didn't make the list and it's really interesting like for for all the time I tried to take researching free agency how you can always find players who get signed that you don't even know are on the market sometimes you don't even know they exist in the NFL and I think it goes to show like the importance of having a 
a brain trust in an organization, having lots of people involved. And if you don't have that, you're not going to make good decisions because you're not going to get all the facts you need. You just simply don't have the time. And so it's kind of, you know, something that takes me to what the Jaguars are doing and how limited of a front office they have right now. I mean, sure, there's some extra people in there, but the people making the decisions, there's a very small group of people. And with Trent Baalke, I mean, he has full control over the decisions on this roster. So I don't think he listens to people very much. I don't think he's very good at that. I think he's kind of proven that in the way he operates. So, you know, just my thoughts on that, um, not necessarily impacting the signing grade or anything like that, but just something I thought of because, you know, I tried to do a lot of research. I took a lot of time. I've spent a lot of my extra time getting ready for these videos, getting ready for the off season, trying to give you guys information. I could not give enough information. So how does one guy run the organization? Just a thought. But as far as the signing, I love this signing. Makes a ton of sense. Ronald Darby was with the Eagles when Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl. He's got experience with him. Darby fits the scheme really well. He's a very cheap player. You lock him down for two years. Even if you draft a cornerback, he is a phenomenal backup for this team. I mean, you're not going to worry if someone goes down to injury. You have a plan. So this really allows the Jaguars to – pivot a little bit more to the best player available approach in the draft, you know, if not for some other things that happen that we'll talk about, but um, you already know those. But Ronald Darby alone, very good player. Yes, he is older, but better scheme fit, and you signed him for significantly less than what Darius Williams was going to get paid, which we thought was a very good deal. I still think it was. And you're paying this guy for two years instead of one. So really good pivot by the team to be able to get Darby on board. Don't agree with uh, with how they dealt with Darius Williams, of course. I think he could have been traded personally, but I don't know. I mean, I, I obviously don't have contact with NFL GM, so maybe they tried and, and couldn't get it done. But Ronald Darby alone, very good player, very happy about the signing, going to be good in press coverage for the Jaguars, smart player, veteran presence, everything you're going to ask for. So love the signing. Love that they got him for two years. It's a great deal for the team. And another A+, plus, not a huge factor on the overall grade, right? But Dearness Johnson was one of the signings I loved last offseason. It's not that he's had like this massive impact with the Jaguars so far. But my thing with Johnson is that I think the Jaguars and every team in the NFL should have a third guy – who can take over for the first guy whenever he gets hurt. And, and the idea is that you have kind of this two-man committee, technically three, you know, when the two guys are kind of worn out and you want to get someone fresh in the game. But you want to have two different types of backs in, and you have your second guy probably be the power back, the guy who can get short yardage, and then the third guy takes over for the first guy when he gets hurt. I think De'Aaron Johnson is an incredible cheap candidate for that because you go back to his time at Cleveland when they had injuries to like Nick Chubb or Kareem Hunt and Johnson was thrown into a starting role he dominated like he was one of the best running backs every time he stepped on the field for that kind of role so I I think he's like criminally underrated I can't believe that he's getting paid what he is or not getting a shot to start somewhere. But, hey, I mean, that's everyone else's problem. You know, obviously running back's a very um, crowded market. There's a lot of players who can get it done. It depends more on your offensive line. But I really like Dearness Johnson for the Jaguars. Very, very good player when he has to take the field. And so it makes me feel better about the injuries that ETN has suffered throughout his career. Because I know that if he goes down as much as it sucks, we got a guy behind him that can come up and step up. So really happy with that. I don't know the contract numbers yet. Hasn't been put out. But I will say last year, I believe it was like one and a quarter million. So 1.25. It's probably the same number this year. I doubt he took a pay cut. And, and I doubt he's earning too much more. It's possible. I'd be fine with that. But we'll have to see what happened there. But De'Aaron Johnson... Really good signing by the Jaguars. And he's actually, on this list, our last signing for the Jaguars. And I will say this right now. 
as as much as we might think like hey they've got a lot more money available now that calvin ridley went to the titans and you know you got 92 million dollars a contract they declined to match they obviously should be able to spend you gotta hold your horses a little bit because well they might spend a little bit more they're restricted to what kind of players they spend on if they want the comp pick, unless they're just giving up on it, which I don't think you can do. I think that's reckless. So they have to spend on certain types of players. Let me mute my phone there. Sorry about that. So those players have to be released, right? You can't spend on unrestricted free agents because now you're basically saying goodbye to that third-round pick officially. So I don't think we'll have a ton more signings. We'll probably have another video, like, going over all this um, in a few weeks, like, what are decisions they make, and we might get some after the draft as well once the the process for compensatory picks comes to an end and everyone's kind of on the same playing level. But just want to say that ahead of time. I don't think we're going to have a ton more signings to talk about in free agency unless it's, like, a splash on Eric Armstead, who I think they're going to get – completely outbid on if they even put in an offer but our two departures to talk about and then we'll get to the overall grade brandon mcmanus uh, it's not going to factor into the grade a ton right but i gave this an a plus like he was really good throughout most of the games but at the end of the day he he had a what three games i think where he just collapsed as a player couldn't make a kick was failing the team. I can't remember if he did in week 18, but it's just the reality. You know, I, I maybe I should say he failed the team. That's kind of harsh. Technically, it's true. But it just wasn't good enough. And if you're a veteran and you're supposed to be really good at your job and have had this great career that's factored into the price, and you have to live up to it. Otherwise, I can go find their kicker, theoretically, that can at least make kicks for a year, you know, even if he gets the – chips or whatever the next season that's still a better option so the Jaguars are smart to pivot away from him the A plus is also considering the fact that they actually got a compensatory pick uh, or not not compensatory pick let me reword this he's counted as a compensatory free agent so that's really good because that's a player we did not expect to count towards the formula so because of that that might help with getting that third rounder for Calvin Ridley because he will cross off one of those players you added. I think right now that player is Ronald Darby. It's one of the seventh round guys. So they need, you know, on top of him and Ridley, three more guys to get signed that were not released, contracts expiring. If you want more information, you have to go to my compensatory pick video I recorded last week. I'll try to put a link to it at the end of this video that you can click on. But Brandon McManus uh, signed a huge deal with the Commanders. I think it was like $3.6 million. I was shocked by that. I think he got more than Nick Folk did, who just signed last night. So that's kind of crazy, especially when you had a bad year. I, I just can't believe that happened. But I'm very happy about it. I'll say that. So let's get to the big one. And, and we're going to sit here for a little bit and talk about this. Calvin Ridley of the Titans. I gave it an F minus. And and I want you to understand why I gave it that grade. It's not it's not because I think they should have paid the 23 million. Because I get why they didn't do that. And I even said myself like the highest I would go in base value was 21 million for him. I don't want to get on the market and start getting outbid and and trying to drive up the price and and just take the fall, right? But you're in a very, very crappy situation because they basically got told to their face, if you don't pay me more than what you plan to, and significantly more, I mean, I think it was like four or five million off a year, I'm going to play for a division rival for four years. We'll see if he sticks out that whole contract, but really crappy situation. And so if I'm just looking at like, you know, should the Jaguars have like matched that offer? I wouldn't give him an F minus. I would give him probably a, a B. You know, because as much as I hate him going to the Titans, like, yeah, you probably can't match that offer. You shouldn't spend this much a receiver. But the reason why it's not a B and it's an F minus is because of the whole process to get to this point, because they set up 
the entire scenario. They, they wrote all the rules to the game. They made it to where they could not extend him before free agency started. And it wasn't even the legal tampering period. It was the new league year. That was the issue. And they had one way out of that, and that was the franchise tag. And they couldn't use the franchise tag because they couldn't extend Josh Allen and had to use it on him. And I get why they did that. I get why they had to spend it on Josh Allen. I don't get why they couldn't extend him. But you know why they didn't extend Josh Allen? Because they don't think he's as good of a player as what he is and what he's demanding. And I like what, I, I hope I call out the right person. I think it was Demetrius Harvey put on Twitter last night that we shouldn't be looking at numbers for these players as just the raw numbers and saying, well, he is earning more than TJ Watt. We need to look at it as at the time of the deal, what is the percentage of your entire salary cap going towards this player? And when you factor that in, if Josh Allen, I think this was the numbers, if he was offered $35 million a year, which is not what he's going to get offered. If he is, that would be crazy. And that could be a conversation there. But say he was, like just the biggest number you could throw out, right? Compared to what TJ Watt earned at $28 million when he signed that, which I think was like 2018, it's a little while ago, the percentage of the cap is like 10% less in, in comparison. So I think like one was 15, and then Josh Allen's was like 13.7. So you have to look at it like that because you don't have more positions on the team you're worrying about. It's the same amount of positions, right? So I really like that point. That was made. I think that makes a ton of sense. But going back to the whole thing with the extension, I mean, we heard off of Ampwig's show, and I, I definitely trust like the sources he has and the things he puts out. I think he's being legitimate. Like, I don't have any question on, on the insider information we get from him. And he said that Trent Baalke, at least before last season, did not believe Josh Allen was number one pass rusher. He thought he was a number two. And one thing we've learned about Trent Baalke that I don't think anyone can argue against at this point is the guy cannot admit when he's wrong and adapt. He can't do it. This is why we're here. This is the entire reason why we are at, at this situation or in this situation. Because when he saw on the field that Josh Allen was a damn good football player. <clears throat> Sorry. It's still early in the morning. My voice is uh, starting to get things together. But when he saw that he was a good player on the football field, it didn't change his thinking. Like, it, it barely modified it to the point where he's never going to get to that number. Like, I, I don't know if he's ever going to get a contract extension done. And we could be in the Brian Burns situation very soon, for all we know, because he can't get to that number. And he's not willing to be proactive about it. There's been multiple opportunities to extend it. And I get, like, if they didn't want to do it last offseason. But that was still an opportunity. And the way you knew the edge market was going, and the fact that you knew that like you need this player to work out, you're not going to be a Super Bowl contender very soon if he's not an elite pass rusher. So you got to pay him. And you didn't have to pay him elite money then. It was like $23, 24000000 million you could have done with him. You know, just If you gave him a good offer, you probably could have convinced him not to just completely bet on himself because they were probably throwing him $18 million. You know, and so that's the one issue. But then you get to the middle of the season when it's clear he's one of the best in the NFL. He's working out. And then you get to the end. And you know the first time you negotiate with him is a month after the season. And it's like, I, I don't know what to say to that. You get paid millions of dollars to do your job. I, and millions and millions, Right. And you cannot get yourself to come into your damn job and sit down at the table with this guy who is literally begging you. Just just talk. That's it. He said at the Pro Bowl. It didn't happen still weeks after that. They wouldn't talk to him. And then they say, oh, we ran out of time. That's what factors into this being an F-. minus. It's all the behind-the-scenes stuff. It's the whole process of how we got here. Because they set the rules to the game. And they had no idea how to play the game. And they announced to the world 
that, hey, we can't use the franchise tag because we won't pay our superstar pass rusher. We'll probably just hit the market next year anyway because, you know, we sure as hell won't pay him. And now we have our number one receiver hitting the market. But by the way, we can't finalize the deal until Wednesday. So please don't, like, you know, throw a curveball at us right before. And, of course, what happens? Your division rival that needs a wide receiver needs that kind of wide receiver, too, to, to fit into this offense. Sees that guy's available. Here's the numbers out there. Knows that the Jaguars are a team that cannot adapt. Everyone knows Trent Baalke in this league. They know who he is. They know the, the kind of mentality he has. And so they come in with a brilliant idea that we are going to throw in an offer that is much larger, that usually should be able to get matched by someone, but we're going to throw them off, right? We're going to we're gonna catch them off guard. And I imagine, honestly, if Jacksonville just got close to that offer, probably wouldn't be back. I don't even know if they had to match the offer, quite frankly. And so... They put Jacksonville in that situation. You have the GM who who can't admit when he's wrong. And so you think he's going to adapt and make something happen? Hell no. He's not going to like go win out with like the guarantees or throw in more incentives or that sort of thing. He's just going to say no. And he's going to let his prized acquisition of his time walk right out the door. Well, the other star player that you're in contract negotiations with just had the price tag go up because Brian Burns got a massive deal after basically being Josh Allen, except he never had the breakout season. Crazy, crazy stuff to me. That's why this gets an F minus because they clearly had a plan where they wanted to keep Calvin Ridley and they thought they could get away letting him hit free agency. I think far before that, they probably had an initial plan where they'd be able to tag Calvin Ridley because they would have thought, Hey, he'll hit maybe 1,100, 1,200 yards. We can give him that money. It's going to be fine. He's our wide receiver one, and Josh Allen will be out the door. I think that this team genuinely was hoping that Daniil Hunter would sign with them this last offseason. They could tag, or sorry, not tag him, they could trade for him and move off of Josh Allen at the trade deadline when they got the huge offers the year before from teams that probably convinced them to think about that again. So, I think that's what happened. It's speculation, right? But regardless, their plan was bad. Their plan was terrible, in fact. And they announced it to the entire world so that a division rival that's known for poaching players, it's not like they're the only one. The Houston Texans do it as well. I think the only team we have in our division that doesn't like just constantly focus its entire existence on poaching our players is probably the Indianapolis Colts. But... You announce that to the world, and you lose your own game. And so it gets an F- minus for that. And out of all the grades, it has to be the biggest one. It has to be the biggest factor, because you went from feeling comfortable yesterday morning, all of us as fans, feeling comfortable about our roster, saying, you know, maybe we need, like, a little bit of depth on the defensive line, right? Like, we don't have a ton of pieces there. We could use, like, a, a young cornerback. Like, there's some things that would be great. But generally, you can pick the best player because you're supposed to have all these needs filled, to now one day later, we're sitting here like, oh my God, who do we pick in the first round? We have to take a receiver. They're all going to go like 10 picks before us. Do we trade up? Do we throw in our first next year? I mean, right now the team might be thinking, well, shoot, we got to make up for this in free agency. What players are we going to sign? We have no clue. We have no plans. Can we sign anyone? I don't think they planned for this at all. They clearly weren't ready. So yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge factor into the overall grade, which I gave him a D plus, and maybe it should be lower. But I don't really factor in everything with Josh Allen into this, which is why they get a D plus. Um, you know, maybe Chris Farley would be happy about that if you've watched that movie. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it was a, a strong start, I felt like. Not overly impressive, right? But Better than I expected, because I had some very low expectations for this team coming into free agency. And I felt like the moves were solid. I was concerned about the comp pick if Ridley walked, because obviously they went out and they signed four compensatory free agents right off the bat. 
So that was a major concern. And here we are now where the worst case scenario is played out because the Jaguars got played at their own game. And so that's why they get a D plus for me. And maybe it deserves to be lower, but not a good couple days for the Jaguars when you consider all the different moves and how important each one is. And at the end of the day, like now you're in a situation where you need the GM who's never hit on a wide receiver before in like a lot of picks. And I get they aren't top three round picks, but still at some point you got to get someone right. You can't do that. He's, he's consistently failed at that position. You need that GM and the head coach who was part of the team who picked Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson just a few years ago, by the way. Doug Peterson was in that room. You can go watch the video. They were excited, but the Vikings were a little more excited because they knew they screwed up. Those two people, and Ethan Waugh, which I don't know his draft history, they've got to find a wide receiver now. And as much as this class is talented, how convinced are you that they don't find the bust? I'm not. And now they're probably going to feel forced into that. So we can hope, like, they go out and they get the player we want and, you know, think that player is going to be great. We don't know if they pick that player. I mean, we legitimately just don't know what they'll do. So I'm very concerned about the situation. I just want to get off this wild ride. But, you know, we're here for life. We're Duval till we die. So that's what I've got for you guys. Let me know what you think about the free agency grades. Um, I know, like, the Calvin Ridley one, some of you guys might be way higher on that, just judging it off of, you know, we don't want to match that price, right? And like I said, like, I'd probably give it a B it, if it's just that as a factor. But when you factor in the whole process, what they wanted to do and how how big of a failure it was to accomplish their goals, I, I gave it an F-. minus. It, sh- it sure as heck doesn't meet 50%. So, yeah, that's what I've got. Hope you guys enjoy this video. Um, I'll keep the free agent news coming if we get anything else. I doubt we get a lot more news. But after that, hopefully next week, we're going to be focusing on draft content, going through positional rankings. We'll have a mock draft out after free agency dust is settled. We do have a pretty good idea now, but we'll at least wait a few more days. So that's what I've got for you. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And finally, go Jags.